So welcome back to our Aliens film adventure through a scene analysis where we are currently at with the fourth installment being presented here. Where we left off from the previous video, the deployment team situated at the exomoon comprising LV-426 were about to experience the pure havoc in the form of the xenomorph creatures as they made their way into the spider layer here in the film known as the Atmosphere Processing Station. There is a dark irony in the location of the processing station, as it is meant for a purpose of converting unbreathable air into a suitable conversion meeting the life requirements of humans. In other words, a life potentiality facility for the use of humans, which has now been inverted into a life formation facility for the xenomorphs, where instead of airborne toxins being converted into hospitable particles, the bodily composition of humans are in turn converted for, as biological fuel for the further life creation of the xenomorph species. Thus, the atmosphere processing station ends up with an anti-humanoid feature rather than pro. I can't help myself but to quote Burke here as he talks about the station earlier, noting that it is comprised of, to quote, a remarkable piece of machinery, completely automated. You know, we manufacture those, by the way. I'm sure in this case, the xenomorphs find human beings a remarkable piece of machinery as well, for all the wrong reasons from the vantage point of humans. We also see upon entry the elaborate design to the facility, stemming from future technology, where we also witness as the alien take over the structure, the myriad of new structures which they have formed. Is it not possible then to view this in terms of a just as advanced, or I would argue more advanced, biological constructed machinery from the point of view of the creatures? The difference here being that the complexity is not cognitively formalized and constructed over a short evolutionary span of time, but rather evolutionarily constructed where small advancements have continually come about through genetic mutations over time in the gene pool. These mutations or genetic variations over time are then subject to evolutionary processes such as natural selection, genetic drift, or other related events. Turning our attention back to the film, we witness the Marines making their entry into the location following the command of Sergeant Apone, who it should be noted exerts far more reassuring confidence in the mission throughout than what is witnessed by Lieutenant Gorman. The fact that he functions as a much more active participant in the scenes he's in must explain some of the reasoning, but I argue here that it is mostly about character and being in possession of leadership skills, which Gorman so severely lacks in all aspects. Also, as a somewhat unrelated side note, the gigantism of the weaponry that the marines use are a very fitting size contrast to that of the aliens that they encounter. I suppose it can be seen as a sort of technological symbolism, where technological weapons upscaling is contrasted against the primordial force of nature which composes the xenomorph creatures, one being designed to kill while the other evolutionarily adapted through successive generations for the same purpose. We see the earliest signs of Ripley essentially outmaneuvering Gorman in terms of leadership by pointing out the danger of firing explosive rounds in the vicinity of primary heat exchanges, thereby employing linear problem skills in real time. That is something we witness in all Alien sequels involving Ripley, namely her adaptiveness for noting problems quickly and more importantly, the construction of a plan under heavy duress of stress. We also note in the scene that the creatures seem triggered after the flamethrower is used in order to kill the chestburster. I always thought this was related to the noise stemming from the chestburster itself, but I am curious as to how sensitive the xenomorphs are to small changes in temperature in their surroundings. We know that the creatures despise extreme temperatures, such as that stemming from a flamethrower, so it seems rational that they would develop a keen sensitivity to detecting temperature changes in their surrounding. Indeed, we get some confirmation of this from the Aliens fandom page, where to quote, The creatures are also capable of detecting heat via highly sensitive 
thermoactive organs located behind the skull's frontal plate, which is itself constructed of the usual C60 carbon lattice known to demonstrate exceptional conductive properties. This, coupled with a highly developed olfactory sense, is thought to be how xenomorphs locate their prey. As the creature's hunting habits are referenced much in terms of their greatly developed sense of smell, I must admit that I find this kind of interesting. Following the deployment team's ambush and Gorman's inability to react to the situation at hand, we see Ripley taking command of the situation by taking command of the armored vehicle, or alien Batmobile as I like to call it. Here, if we were to make an analysis of Gorman's character, it is not that he is a bad person, despite the fact that he does bad things under stress and duress, such as not assessing tactical situations for what they really are, namely real-life situations and not one-to-one -one correspondences with previously described mission reports or other forms of simulated training. Rather, it is that he suffers from being put in the wrong role in terms of the vocation that he finds himself in, as that of a lieutenant in the Marine Corps. There may of course be other roles which may serve his personal identity better, even within the confines of the military. The key point here is, however, that personal identity cannot be separated from social relations, and it is through the interactions as well as relations with others that allow us to see ourselves for what we truly are. In the case of Gorman, the interactions with others clearly dictates that he is not taken seriously within his own squadron of marines, as is evident when we see him constantly failing to command the proper respect of the deployment seam sent to the surface of LV-426. This is contrasted with the character of Sergeant Apone, who despite being disciplinary, has the relaxed ability to blend in with the marines, fulfilling the unitary envelopment that comprises a military unit, for camaraderie, bravery, and legitimized risk-taking are seen as virtues. The stiffness of Gorman's commands does not resonate with the Marines, as it is perceived in essence as artificial, stiff, and above else, overly formal, as if taken out of some training manual previously devoured. There is a marked difference between that of personal commitment and that of compliance, for the latter is what is essentially followed in terms of Gorman's commands and directions. As if to make matters worse, one observes that even when the orders are complying with his orders, as when he gets the marines to give up their cartridges, there is still a lack of trust in his judgment as we note Private Vasquez is more than willing to distribute more concealed ammunition to the marines as they make their way to the atmosphere processing station turned into a hive now. As Burke candidly remarks when he tells him that he had to quote, had his chance, which is again a reflection of his poor judgment as is perceived by his social interactions. This point in time in the film is also important as it signifies a point in the film where there is a transition of power handed over to Ripley as she is seen extracting the marines from the processing station, thereby saving the remaining lives. Moving along in the film, we see the gradual re-emergence of hope as the surviving marines are rescued by Ripley, and with it the prospect of nuking the installation from above ground. This is again showcasing the leadership abilities of Ripley, coming up with the nuke idea where we see, stemming from the fact that the marines have been introduced to the frightful nature of the creatures, they now seem much more susceptible to take advice from Ripley. And let's not forget, that she just saved the marines' lives. However, this all comes horribly crashing down in an inferno, so to speak, of flames as we witness the rescue dropship being crashed after a literal, in this case, alien terrorist takeover of the ship, pun intended. This also marks the character transition point of the character of Private Hudson, who has something of an emotional meltdown after witnessing the crash. The barrage of military macho-induced comments that we witnessed earlier in the film will therefore be have to put on hold as he seems extremely pessimistic regarding their hopes of making it out alive. Much like we witnessed in the previous installment of Aliens, we learn that the xenomorphs have been using the ventilation system to their aid in terms of transportation 
where we also learn from Newt that they are mostly active at night. Ripley thus manages with the aid of architectural blueprints to come up with a plan alongside Hicks of sealing off all access routes for the xenomorphs to enter into the main colony complex. This will make for one of the most accelerating scenes later on where we see a whole swarm of xenomorphs being gunned down by the machine gun turrets which have been installed. It is also around this time juncture in the film where we see some romantic tensions blossoming between Corporal Hicks and Ripley herself as he straps a location device around the wrist of Ripley's arm making the Joe comparison of an engagement ring. It's a tension that I claim is a lot more overt than that of the first film where there is a more latent attraction between Ripley and that of Dallas on board the Nostromo. Corporal Hicks' affection for Ripley is obviously related to her displaying traits of competence and leadership, as well as being sensitized to the situation unfolding, especially in regards to Newt, of course as well as her general independence as a character. Thus we might see the origins of this attraction developing already at the juncture where Ripley shows her proclivity for operating the automatic loading machine or forklift earlier in the film, which in turn greatly impresses both Apone and that of Hicks. This scene might be viewed by some initially as more of a trivial scene to first time viewers, but it is anything but, as it indeed showcases something important in regards to Ripley's skill set, namely her aptitude for observational learning, which is something showcased in each new encounter that she has with the menacing alien species. Couple this with her skills of persuasion, and we can see why she is such an adept leader in many ways. We can furthermore contrast this with Burke, who has certainly persuasive abilities, but what he lacks is getting over the fear of getting himself involved in dangerous situations, as well as providing useful tactical insight for the marines. Of course, as is later revealed, he does not mind staking the lives of marines, or for that matter civilian lives, as long as he can safely secure a much sought after specimen of alien creatures for the company to exploit. This in turn reveals the opportunistic nature of his character, where we at the very least have to give him credit for not being afraid to manipulate his surroundings to his own personal benefit, even if it may be at the cost of the group as a whole, which is fine by him as he views them in terms of expendable assets, not much unlike the Wayland yutani Corporation viewed the Nostromo and its crew in the first film. There is a rather endearing scene where Ripley is seen consoling Newt in bed as she goes to sleep, where there is a reference made to the reproductive cycle pertaining to babies. I bring this up as it alludes symbolically to the, in my perception, the perversion of the female reproductive cycle that the xenomorphs represent, where you have on the one hand people being exploited as repositories to the formation of chest bursters terminating its host upon exiting, and on the other hand the overarching control element which is represented by the Wayland yutani Corporation, who in turn wish to exercise further control of the foreign life cycle of the xenomorphs through their reliance upon clinical technological gadgetry. In this sense, as I have alluded to in earlier videos, the technological expansionism of science is put up against the primordial biological termination entities known as the xenomorphs, where it's clear that science can indeed be put to morally abhorrent practices by trying to exert control over a process which defies it at every opportunity, where the end result always seems to be that of even more chaos and destruction. Another interesting interpretation, which I have not explored earlier, might be that the Alien franchise taken as a whole might be seen to be making a prescriptive claim about the non-interference in relation to animals, where we can rely on arguments stemming from that of animal ethics. The argument here might be formulated as twofold. Number one, being that you are not capable of providing the full lives which the animals deserve, one should abstain from such action. And number two, animals suffer more in the hands of us than they would under adequate naturalistic conditions. I might also add here a more Kantian approach in relation to the Xenoverse under jurisdiction of the Wayland-Yutani Corporation, 
treating the creatures in terms of their end goal instead of as a goal in themselves, thereby negating their right to autonomy even though they are killer reptilian goddesses. Although it's worth pointing out here that the cat Jonesy seems to defy this interpretation as the pet relation between the ginger cat and Ripley is not put to any bad shade of light in any sense. And as keeping pets would be a type of interference, we would expect that even this relation would be challenged in some sense under this film interpretation. I will leave this video off here as we will discuss the upcoming betrayal of Burke in more detail in the next video, where we will also devote a larger portion to the discussion of the synthetic character known as Bishop, which should be interesting. If you have any comments, suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below and don't forget to subscribe and like the video.